The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. And a uh, very good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for spending the next 45 minutes with us. Uh, my name is Keith Gallup. I'm the Director of Client Services with Kelly Santini. Very pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, part of an ongoing series of insurance law webinars presented by uh, the Insurance Defense Group. Uh, we've been running these webinars for a few years now, and uh, very pleased to say this is the uh, largest turnout we've ever had for a webinar. So uh, Mitch, Sean, no pressure. Uh, obviously, case law updates are uh, a topic that people are very interested in, and so over the next 45 minutes or so, Mitch and Sean will take you through uh, some of the recent cases uh, that are going to be of interest for your business, uh, dating back uh, well, most of 2014 and creeping back a little bit into 2013. Uh, our presenters, uh, Mitch, a partner in the group, and Sean, an associate uh, in the Insurance Defense Group, are uh, prepared and ready to go. As we... Uh, uh, as they present their cases, please do uh, send in any questions that you have. Uh, check them in in the dialog box that uh, should be on your screen, and then uh, we will certainly reserve some time towards the end of the session uh, as we get towards 1 o'clock uh, to answer as many questions as we can. So uh, I will now turn things over to uh, Mitch and Sean. Thanks, Keith. Um, hi, Mitch Kitagawa here. Um, I noticed from, our, uh, from the registration we're going... Um, from the east to the west across Canada, we have uh, I think the registration said 2.5 million people, <laughs> or something less than that. Anyways, I'm a little disappointed there was better introductory music, Keith. I got to tell you, I expect something dramatic. Fan, I'll work on some, that for next one. Some kind of fanfare or something like that. Um, anyway, so for those of you who know me, hello, and uh, for those of you who don't know me, I look exactly like Brad Pitt. Um, and you know what the funny thing is, Sean Van Helm looks exactly like Angelina Jolie. I do. <laughs> I have lost some weight in the last couple of months. <laughs> no, I, that's not true. It's actually the other way around. Anyways, the last one I, um, the last one of these we did, uh, I was told it was kind of boring, so I thought I would start with a joke, and it's sort of an insurance joke, but more of a lawyer joke. So a lawyer and an engineer were fishing in the Caribbean, and the lawyer says, I'm here because my house burned down and everything I owned was destroyed by the fire. The insurance company paid for everything. And that's quite a coincidence, says the engineer. I'm here because my house and all my belongings were destroyed by a flood, and my insurance company also paid for everything. The puzzled lawyer asked, how did you start a flood? <laughs> all right. <laughs> it's a good thing I can't hear the groans, eh? <laughs> I can't hear the moans and groans. Well, um, the first ca case I'm going to talk to you about is Reniac versus Malden, and uh, it's important because this is going to change the landscape of litigation uh, going forward, and uh, so I wanted to um, I wanted to st sort of st to start this case by giving you a little bit of a background. First of all, for those of you who aren't familiar with motions for summary judgment, and they might be called something else in other jurisdictions, uh, what that does is it allows you to bring a claim before the court in order to get a decision. Um, either a plaintiff can do it to get a decision uh, to confirm their claim and get them a judgment, or a defendant can bring it to have the claim uh, dismissed. Now. These uh, types of motions were actually uh, discouraged. The courts didn't want people to bring these motions because they thought everyone would bring them sort of willy-nilly. And there was a rule um, that uh, was if you had lost your motion, then you'd have to pay what is now called substantial indemnity costs. So it was a rule that tried to discourage people from bringing these motions. So few parties would bring them. Uh, and it was especially to dismiss the case because they, the courts were worried that everyone would, would bring this motion just as a, um, uh, as a, uh, a typical step in the proceedings. And they didn't want that. They only wanted them where cases were more obvious and you could, uh, you could do that. Uh, what they found when they brought the motions that judges, especially defense motions, was that judges didn't want to kill the cases. Even if it was obvious, the plaintiff didn't have a chance. Um, the courts, the judges wanted to make sure that the plaintiff had their day in court by way of a trial. Uh, and it also allowed them to sort of pass off the decision to whomever the trial judge, uh, the trial judge might be. Uh, however, once trial lists began to expand ridiculously and court resources were stretched thin, the court started thinking again about this, and that's why there was a revamp of the summary judgment motion rules. So the summary judgment motions, which derive their authority in Ontario from Rule 20 of the Rules of Civil Procedure, were rewritten 
and it gave the courts more powers. They could weigh evidence and credibility and make inferences from affidavit materials, uh, and they removed the rule about substantial indemnification if a party lost. Now, they were encouraging people to bring these motions so the courts could deal with actions quickly and get them exiting the system quickly uh, with less cost for the system and, of course, a quicker disposition for the parties. So the new rules, uh, what were then the new rules, were interpreted by the Court of Appeal of Ontario in a case called Combined Air. And uh, the court encouraged parties to bring these types of motion uh, and told judges that they could rule on them based on what they called then the full appreciation test. And in general terms, what it meant was that if the court can get a full appreciation of the case, appreciation of the case then it could make a decision. Well, that um, approach to motion for summary judgments went to the um, went to the Supreme Court, and basically they sort of overturned uh, the full appreciation test. Um, and uh, what you ended up with was a, a new roadmap for um, summary judgment. Um, now, you don't really have to know, as, uh, as insurers, you don't really have to know what the roadmap is, although we've got it on here. But, um, what, you, but what you have to know is, um, just to give you a sense of why this decision uh, is what it is, and what I mean by that is, what the Supreme Court did was they looked at this as an access to justice type of situation. They looked they were always concerned about ordinary people having access to the courts. And the biggest uh, impediment or hurdle to getting to court is, of course, the cost. And trials, as you probably all know, uh, will it's not uncommon for them to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And while an insurance company can afford that, the mere mortal uh, can't. And so this is what the Supreme Court was trying to do. They were trying to create a different... Um, uh, forum or theater in which you can have your case heard, which wasn't a trial and would could be uh, more affordable for uh, for people. Uh, and so that's why you see in the slide they talk about summary judgment rules must be interpreted uh, and they're favoring proportionality, uh, fair access, affordable, timely, and a just, uh, a just adjudication of claims. And so that's what they're going after. They're trying to uh, make the court system a little more accessible to uh, to, um, to people. Uh, and so they go on to talk about the fact that the best form for resolving uh, a dispute is not always the most painstaking procedure. What they mean is it's not always a trial. It's not always the best way to uh, necessarily in order to come up with a determination. So they came up with this roadmap approach. And as I say, uh, it's not something that you necessarily need to uh, to know about as, a, um, as an insurer because this is what your um, what your lawyer should know about. Um, but basically speaking, they're looking at a, whether or not there's a genuine issue that requires a trial. If it doesn't require a trial, then you can use uh, the summary judgment procedure. If it appears that there's a genuine issue that requires a trial, then the judge can go to their new powers. And those are the powers I talked about previously, about things like evidence and weighing credibility. So they can uh, use that. And then if they can't make a determination based on that, then what they can do is they can set up a, um, uh, one of the, what they call the, the mini-trials or a summary uh, trial. And what that allows you to do then is to use all the materials you use to prepare for the motion for summary judgment, but still use them in a trial procedure. So again, it saves you money. You don't have to go back and reinvent everything. Uh, the other thing that I think is important is that uh, the Supreme Court said that the judge who hears the motion for summary judgment is seized of the matter. So now the judge doesn't have the um, uh, ability to sort of pass the decision on to another trial judge. They're seized with it, so they have to deal with it. And so it'll probably, I guess the idea is that it will encourage the judge to deal with it, uh, you know, at the uh, motion um, at the, at the motion as opposed to maybe at a summary trial or at a, at a full trial later on. Um, so I think for this case, and you notice I didn't go into the facts because really the facts aren't that important, but I think the takeaway for the insurers um, is this. Uh, trials aren't, um, you know, the courts are no longer looking at trials as the ultimate arena for deciding your cases. And so when you look at your file and you say to yourself, 
uh, this thing looks like it should settle sooner rather than later. And if there's maybe one or two points that just have to be determined by court in order for you to get it to settle, then you might want to think about a motion for summary judgment. If you think that the claim can be dismissed based on the, um, based on the facts, then you might want to encourage your, uh, your lawyer to bring a motion for summary judgment. Um, you're going to see this, and you may actually face these more and more, uh, as defendants in actions as well, where the plaintiff feels that they um, that they have a, let's say they've got a slam dunk on liability, um, and maybe they want to uh, get that out of the way so that then they can focus on costs. You may start to see a lot more of these types of uh, a lot types a lot more types of these uh, motions coming along. Uh, but I think for insurers, uh, as I say, keep it in mind for instruction to your counsel. And ask them if you think if they think that the claim made by the plaintiff or even part of it is um, is suitable for a, a motion for for summary judgment. Um, but this is going to change the landscape for sure. And um, the idea is to make it uh, cheaper for everyone. I'm not sure if that'll be the case. I suppose time will tell. But um, uh, but you're going to see a lot more of these uh, coming along. Well, and we've already seen one case here in Ottawa where that is exactly the effect that has happened. Um, one of the very positive outcomes of this decision is it has entirely done away with what Justice Brown in Toronto essentially deemed in his decisions as a requirement that examinations for discovery be conducted before such a motion could be brought and under the first branch of the roadmap approach determining whether there is a genuine issue requiring a trial that came up in the recent case of Pamet v. Ashcroft uh, we can email the, uh, the decision out uh, shortly after the long story short in that one was a young lady slipped and fell in front of a Tim Hortons here in Ottawa and uh, she commenced settlement discussions through her lawyer uh, within a couple of months. Now she thought that Tim Hortons was responsible for the exterior sidewalk in which she fell and as you can imagine in a circumstance like this it's never that straightforward. The Tim Hortons Corporation that operated within the building leased the interior premises and they were the restaurant operator. The building itself was owned by another corporation and there was yet a third corporation who was responsible for the winter maintenance. Despite engaging in settlement discussions with all three parties, for some reason on the eve of the limitation period expiring, the plaintiff chose to sue only the Tim Hortons operator itself. They didn't sue the property owner, they didn't sue the property maintenance manager. Um, and as a result of that, when a subsequent action was issued against those two by the plaintiff, they brought a motion for summary judgment to have it dismissed. And, and what the master held here in Ottawa was again under that first branch, if a defendant can show that the limitation period expired before the plaintiff commenced the action against it, the defendant has a complete defense and the action will be statute barred. And it's an unfortunate outcome for the person involved in there, but again the question that the court asked was uh, whether she, the plaintiff, ought to have known that there were other parties that might share liability or be liable instead of the party that they had actually named. So I think this is an encouraging one from the perspective of the adjusters, uh, particularly in this case, who were actively engaged with plaintiff's counsel in settlement discussions prior to the, the case or the uh, action being issued against them. That certainly didn't preclude a finding by the court that the Limitation Act barred the statute, or sorry, uh, statutorily barred the action because the plaintiff hadn't commenced the action in time. I see, Kate, or I see uh, Keith is looking at his watch. That means keep moving, keep yeah. moving. <laughs> well, the next one won't be too long. Uh, we're going to jump from the beginning uh, of, of litigation right to what's usually the end, which is settlement discussions. This is a case of Union Carbide, Canada, and Bombardier. So uh, we'll start the discussion with settlement privilege, which I'm sure you're all aware is the, the without prejudice rule. It protects communications exchanged by parties uh, via letter, correspondence, telephone even that uh, when we're trying to settle litigation, that those, the contents of those correspondence typically can't be disclosed without the consent of all the parties. And one of the limited exceptions to that, which is known in the case law, is that a communication that has led to settlement can cease to be privileged if disclosing it is necessary to prove the existence of, of the scope of a settlement. So it happens on occasion that a settlement is reached and afterwards terms are disagreed upon and certain uh, elements of that discussion must be brought to light for a court to make a determination on whether or not to enforce a settlement. So in this case, uh, pretty straightforward, uh, Dow Chemical, the company behind Union Carbide, made gas tanks that uh, Barbardier put in their sea dues and uh, some of the gas tanks were de defective, it caused a recall and lawsuits were launched. Now what's interesting is uh, in this case, it was only Canadian case that was dealt with out of Quebec. 
The parties entered into a settlement discussion, and the settlement was reached, but there was some confusion as to the scope of the settlement. Dow afterwards said that they believed that the settlement absolved it of global responsibility and liability, and they wanted Bombardier to sign a release to that effect. And Bombardier, not surprisingly, had the opposite view, that it was only for Canadian litigation. So they brought a motion uh, before the court for determination, and the, the essence, what turned on this case, was there was a standard clause within the mediation contract that put a blanket ban on alleging, referring, or putting into any evidence or proceeding anything that transpired during the mediation discussions. And what the party was trying to rely on uh, for this settlement agreement was that that clause was in itself enough to displace the common law rule against disclosing the contents of settlement discussions. And uh, this went to the Supreme Court of Canada. Effectively, uh, Dow Chemical wanted to strike out the allegations within Bombardier's affidavit evidence that referred specifically to the settlement discussions that happened there. And so what's important for us is kind of the overall holding that the Supreme Court held, which is, yes, parties are free to agree to confidentiality clauses that either identify and uphold the scope of settlement privilege and its exception, or even to contract out of it if they so wish. However, if they do so, the uh, the confidentiality clause has to be explicitly worded and it has to be clear to all of the parties that that is what they intended to do. And of course, in this case, being from Quebec, they did apply Quebec contract law, and that would be the case in any such situation. But fortunately, contract law really on this point doesn't differ, differ too much from, uh, from coast to coast. So the takeaway is that absent an express and clearly worded provision to the contrary, you can assume that any settlement discussions that you enter into, whether at mediation or in correspondence, uh, will be subject to the, the, uh, the possible exception. And you know, adding the phrase without prejudice to the top of a letter uh, is not going to be enough to, to uh, displace that. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind when you're entering into settlement discussions. The advice we always give is whether it's without prejudice or not is imagine that this might someday be evidence before a court and might, so a decision may ultimately turn on the contents of it and what was agreed upon or not agreed upon. I just uh, have a question for you. I want to ask you about this. Um, I had a case where uh, we had a settlement and then the question was whether or not that settlement included confidentiality. And it wasn't in the, it wasn't in the release, it wasn't negotiated, but it was contained in the mediation agreement. What do you think about that? Would uh, do you think that the the, uh, the settlement itself is subject to confidentiality as a result of the mediation agreement, or uh, can someone walk out of there and say, "Hey, I got a settlement from these guys, and here's how much"? That would be an interesting matter for a court to determine, it, because effectively the settlement privilege is a common law rule that, to my understanding of it, applies essentially to the nature of the discussions themselves, not to the question of whether or not settlement was reached. Um, Presumably, any of the terms and the contents of, of the settlement itself would be privileged, but there doesn't appear to be anything uh, within it that would bar a party from disclosing to others that they had, in fact, settled the lawsuit. In fact, uh, as we see all the time, frankly, the, uh, uh, the media on certain cases that they choose to follow and report on, they'll be well aware when a settlement has been reached. Uh, they can read between the lines when a notice for dismissal or a request for dismissal is filed. Um, so I think a party would be, and I think the, the lawyer's advice, and this would go for, for the insurance justice as well, the, the fact that a matter has settled, probably not privileged at all, but anything that went into it certainly shouldn't be the subject of debate, any of the, the terms uh, essentially of the discussion, unless they themselves are the subject of debate. And it sounds like the case that you're, uh, you're hitting on would straddle both lines if you ended up bringing a motion uh, for homologation of that. That's exactly what the court would have to consider is, or consider is whether or not to disclose whether or not confidentiality was discussed. Good. We, we caved on that, so. <laughs> <laughs> so it got settled. All right. Well, the next, um, the next case I'm going to do is... Um, or I'm going to speak about is uh, Moore versus Gedahun. Um I don't know if I pronounced that properly. Um, this case, the, the facts of this aren't that um, aren't that important. It was just a personal injury case. But what is of great importance is the uh, what the judge said about uh, expert reports. Now, prior to this case, you may recall that. Um, 
as uh, as lawyers, we would um, uh, we used to get our experts to do their research. They'd review their evidence, or review the evidence we might provide to them, and then before they write the report, they would let us know what they found, and then they would ask us if we wanted a report or not. Uh, if we asked for a report, we might make suggestions of areas we wanted reviewed or emphasized. Uh, then once the draft report was pre prepared, you would review it and send it to our clients. Uh, we, well, we would review it uh, and then send it to you for your review. Uh, you would get them. You'd discuss with counsel if you wanted any changes. And the counsel might go back to the expert to see if changes could be made uh, to see if you could come up with a, a final report. Now, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, again in Ontario, the rules regarding expert reports were changed such that the experts now have to sign what's called a Form 53, and that states that the experts are supposed to be neutral, and they're there to assist the court in understanding whatever issue it is that they're supposed to be looking at. Uh, now, in this case, so in the Moore case, uh, the issue of counsel reviewing reports before they were finalized came up. And basically what the court said was that this has to stop. And in fact, it said that if any changes are made as a result of counsel's instruction, these had to be disclosed to the court. And it said that uh, this was because the requirement of Rule 53 for experts to be neutral um, is uh, paramount now. Uh, and so these communications uh, have to be uh, disclosed and uh, certainly uh, there's no reason for counsel to suggest suggest the altering of a final report. Um, so, uh, and you'll see that in the it's reflected in the uh, in the slide that the primary the expert's primary duty is is to assist, assist the court. Uh, and so, discussions, meetings between counsel and expert to review and shape a draft uh, are no longer acceptable. Um, so, uh, if after, and the bullet says, uh, if after submitting the final expert report, counsel believes that there's a need for clarification or amplification, any input whatsoever from counsel should be, uh, in writing, should be disclosed to opposing counsel. Um, and I think that um, uh, the takeaway for the adjusters on this is that you're just not going to see uh, any expert reports uh, before uh, you get a final draft. What you will likely see now is a final draft on these things. So, you know, you, I guess you, um, you have to look closely at your files, as you always do, with respect to uh, what you hope to see from the report, what you expect to get from the report. And I think uh, counsel, of course, has to be careful with respect to their communications to the expert uh, to make sure that, um, uh, you know, they're not trying to steer the expert in a particular direction, or at least not seem to be doing that uh, so that the report is seen to be um, uh, as neutral as possible. Now having said that, and uh, maybe this is, this is again a, a quick topic of discussion, uh, does it really matter, I wonder, from uh, to a court uh, whether or not they see this uh, Form 53, and the Form 53 just states from the expert that they're neutral, or is it more important uh, for a judge as to who commissioned the report and whether or not that would influence a judge's view on the report itself. Uh, my suspicion is that's really what a judge will look at. A Form 53 doesn't really change what an expert does, uh, although they're supposed to be more neutral, but the truth of the matter is that was always the case for expert reports um, in uh, for experts reports that came to, came to trial. They were always supposed to be neutral and always supposed to um, uh, represent the expert's uh, unbiased view of the uh, uh, of whatever issue it is that they're looking at. And it's, this case is currently under appeal, so uh, we'll wait to see what um, what the court of appeal will have to say about it. And interestingly, I think it's uh, going to be heard the same week in September of this year with the Westerhoff and Gee, uh, a case from 2013 that addresses the, the issue that you just raised. Uh, Westerhoff and Gee was a case that overruled McNeil. This is going back to 2010, uh, anyone that was involved in the cases dealing with the expert reports, and whether or not experts who had been retained outside of the context of litigation could actually show up at trial and give evidence. Uh, there's, there's been some conflicting case law on that, and what the Divisional Court in Westeroff held was that it wasn't the role, uh, as Miss just outlined, but it's the type of evidence sought to be admitted. 
Now, they went a step further. What they said in Westeroff was if you've got somebody on the stand who's giving opinion evidence, they better have complied with Rule 5303. In that case, they disallowed uh, certain statutory accident benefits medical examiners to provide evidence, driving instructor counselors, uh, physicians. They even redacted the contents of MRIs and radiographic uh, evidence that had been before the court where it contained opinion because the people who attended it hadn't complied with Rule 53. And of course, that decision is completely irreconcilable with McNeil, and uh, we've, we've been needing some appeal level decision on this case or on this topic for four years. So we're looking forward to getting that, hopefully, sometime after September. So Zurich VTD, if I could see a show of hands for everybody that handles uh, statutory accident benefits and loss transfer provisions, this one will be of interest to you. Just last year we had a case to Wait, say, wait, are oh, you going to make a crack about this is radio and not TV? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. And because the funny thing is that even if it was TV, you couldn't see them. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> The uh, next time we'll have a video webinar and hopefully we'll have uh, 118 blocks on our screen. We'll all be <laughs> Skyping. Yeah. Uh, the question is, does the doctrine of latches apply to loss transfer? So loss transfer is an indemnity scheme under the Insurance Act whereby first party insurers can recover accident benefits paid to their insurers from second parties under certain circumstances. One of the most common ones that, uh, that arises is when an individual in an automobile is being paid ABs as a result of an accident with a tractor trailer truck or a large vehicle. So what happened in Zurich and TD uh, was the, uh, the accident happened in 1999 in July and TD paid out their accident benefits for the next 10 years. There was a tort claim, not surprisingly, that settled and Zurich actually contributed most of the settlement uh, amount to that. And so that was all done with in 2009. So in February 2010, about 11 years after the accident, TD sends a loss transfer request and uh, followed it up with a request for indemnity and it was refused. They subsequently tried to commence arbitration and the decision, uh, and this is what we have before us now, is whether or not they had delayed in such an extensive period of time in bringing the request for indemnity that they could not now actually bring it. There's certainly no provision in law barring that as the intact and Lombard case said last year, the clock begins to run from the time the request is provided, not the time that a notice is provided. And uh, in this case, though, uh, the timing was obviously a little bit different, and there was a judge who had a completely different take on the doctrine of latches. Uh, first and foremost, the judge focused on the idea that the, I guess, traditional rigid line between law and equity has been broken down, and that a court shouldn't be precluded from applying equitable doctrines and defenses to a claim simply because the claim arises out of statute. And what the judge held was that the Ontario loss transfer regime has what he deemed an equitable flavor because it is designed to address unfairness between participants in the province's insurance industry. And that alone was a sufficient basis to permit the application of the doctrine of latches. Uh, alternatively, uh, in also addressing the decision, the judge said that, uh, frankly, the fusion of, of law and equity over the last couple of hundred years has evolved to achieve fairness and justice. And uh, without any explanation said, that's another reason that latches applies in this case. So all of that to say, uh, it, it is completely at odds uh, with the intact and Lombard case, in my view. Um, but the judge in Zurich had some uh, criticisms of that decision and pointed out that the judge may have gotten the law of latches wrong in the Lombard case, uh, in that the judge there was looking at acquiescence and prejudice as two requirements, whereas in this case, uh, looking at the exact same Supreme Court of Canada case, uh, the judge actually focused on the fact that the, there's two independent branches of latches. Uh, one is that the party has acquiesced, and the second is that there has been a situation giving rise to prejudice due to the delay. So that seems to be the, uh, the grounds on which they're differentiating it. And, and frankly, I'd be shocked uh, if I don't see an appeal out of this decision because, again, it's irreconcilable with, uh, with the other one and the consequences could be quite significant. So the takeaway for anyone involved in a loss transfer matter is don't wait. Uh, you just certainly don't want to rest on, on your laurels. Uh, now, 10 years, I think, is pretty excessive. I, I don't think we need to worry that there's anyone here sitting on a decade-old case. Uh, again, the intact and Lombard case was one that was a four-year delay, and, and that seemed to be one that the court gave short shrift to, uh, to throwing out as far as not being a significant delay. But five to 10 years certainly is, is a significant period of time. So send the notice out, follow it up with a request, and initiate arbitration within two years. I like the fact that the file is out there for over 10 years. I wonder, I wonder what the audit said <laughs> that, uh, that sparked that, that file handler to get that notice out. <laughs>
That's the same case, yeah. So again, in terms of why the uh, the court just upheld that, you'll see in the second bullet point there the three parts that the judge focused on. Uh, obviously, the the one we hear time and time again, insurers are big, rich, sophisticated. They had knowledge and capacity, and they really couldn't explain the 11-year delay, particularly as you were involved in litigation with the same party. All right, I'm going to jump over to Hopkins NK. Did you get that? Jump, hop. Okay. Very good. Thank you. How are we doing for time? We have about 10 more minutes, and then okay. we'll take some questions. All right. Um, Hopkins and Kay is an interesting case, and um, it has to do with what you call intrusion on seclusion or what we know as a breach of privacy. And so this is a case in which uh, hundreds of health records of clients at the Peterborough Regional Health Center were accessed without patient consent by employees at the hospital and a local college. Uh, apparently, the employees were dismissed. Uh, and there was an admission by the hospital that the information was given with no lawful excuse, and it was given to outside third parties. So this was um, this decision was a motion for summary judgment to dismiss the action, and the court said uh, that they wouldn't dismiss it, and they based it on another case called uh, Jones versus Siege. That's T S I G E uh, from the Ontario Court of Appeal, and the Ontario Court of Appeal said that um, you can have a claim. Uh, you may not have to show actual damages for it. Uh, now, what I find interesting about this case is that it only exists in Ontario right now. Uh, it's not reflected apparently in BC. Um, but the question I think for file handlers is, because I think you're going to see more of these, is what are you going to do with it when it comes in? Uh, do you actually do you actually cover it? Um, uh, and I'm not going to go too much into the to the case in and of itself, but I want to talk about its uh, potential impact on insurance. And if you look closely at your typical insurance policy, a commercial policy, for instance, uh, it'll suggest that um, you uh, insurance companies cover damages which are either uh, damage to property or bodily injury. Um, and so the question here is. Uh, is this one of those? What I mean by that is, what has happened here? Is there property damage? It doesn't appear to be property damage. So the next question is, is there bodily injury? And I'm not sure if uh, an intrusion on one's seclusion is a bodily injury. I'm going to suggest that um, it would have to go so far as to cause someone some sort of bodily, or obviously more likely psychological injury. So if there is, for instance, uh, extreme stress in having that information um, uh, disclosed, then uh, you, might, um, you might have to cover that type of, um, uh, you'd have to cover that. But if there wasn't, and if someone was just uh, upset or concerned, but not necessarily suffering a physical injury, whether or not you would have to, uh, whether or not you'd have to cover that, and I suggest you you wouldn't. Um, but I think you're going to see more of these types of claims uh, as file handlers. And one of the things it reminds me of is the claims that uh, some insurers may be seeing now, where there's, um, for instance, um, a real estate deal gone bad, where the uh, purchaser is now suing the vendor who is the insured. And they're suing them because of a misrepresentation made at the time of the uh, of the purchase, and the purchaser says there's a negligent misrepresentation. Um, for those of you in Ontario, you know the SPIS, the uh, Seller Property Information Sheet, uh, which discloses problems with the uh, with the property or not. And so there's typically a claim that comes out of that saying you didn't fill that form out properly, and so you were negligent. Uh, and then the Vendor takes that and brings it to takes the claim and brings it to the insurance company. And says, "Hey, you have to cover me because they're suing me for negligence." The problem that they have, I think, in trying to cover them is the insurance company looks and says, "Well, wait a minute. Your negligent misrepresentation did not cause the problems that the plaintiff is talking about. What it did was it enticed the plaintiff to enter into an agreement of purchase and sale. Therefore, it didn't cause bodily injury." Your negligent misrepresentation didn't cause property damage, so you don't have insurance for that. And that's where I see the Hopkins and Kay um, case fitting in, is that it's going to be one of those cases where insurers are going to be asked to cover them because of quote-unquote negligence, uh, and they may not uh, cover them. However, where you may see it 
is where there's specific insurance, which is there to cover um, either uh, the, the um, uh, distri the uh, I guess unwarranted or un uh, consented to. I don't know if that's a word. Anyways, if you see the unauthorized disclosure of information, and in those policies uh, there may be coverage, but in your typical um, liability policy, I don't believe it would be. It's funny you mentioned the homeowners scenario, Mitch, because it's I was thinking of another angle that this case gives me pause for concern on. In in finding that the, uh, the statutory provisions of uh, the Personal Health Information Protection Act don't preclude the freestanding tort, one of the things that I was reminded of was the Unifund case out of London, Ontario, I think two years ago now. This was a case that uh, exactly the scenario you described, a house purchaser sued the vendors for uh, being negligent in fulfilling or completing the SPIS and alleging some property damage as a result of it. What was interesting was they actually didn't sue for negligent misrepresentation. They sued for fraudulent misrepresentation. They alleged exclusively deliberate torts for which there was clearly no coverage. And after examinations for discovery, plaintiff's counsel clearly amended the claim deliberately to trigger coverage by adding negligent misrepresentation to it. And the court allowed it. The court allowed it and also ordered the insurer to pay costs going back to the outset of trial uh, or the action, notwithstanding the fact that there were none. And this, I could see this happening in this sort of scenario too. If you're looking at a case where an individual corporation, company, or person doesn't have coverage for the type of breach of privacy uh, sort of scenario that can imagine, you could envision somebody crafting a claim to plead that it arose as a result of negligence. And as a result of the negligence, they've sustained exactly the bodily injury you described, some sort of a psychological harm that, uh, for which they want to seek damages. Yeah, that's, it's funny. We could get into those cases, but there's a line of cases that, uh, those real estate cases that sort of missed a step, and we're now sort of getting back to saying, wait a minute, you know, there's just no insurance for that. So, yeah. All right. Let's keep, our, let's keep the show moving. Okay, yeah. COZO and the personal. Uh, I imagine many of you dealing in motor vehicle accidents liability Field. I've heard of this case right now. For me, it, it is impossible to consider this case without also being reminded of Tut. Uh, the case of Tut that went to the Court of Appeal a couple of years ago, of course, was a decision regarding a young man who had consumed alcohol on his birthday the night before driving a car and was found to be driving with alcohol in his system the next day when he caused an accident. And uh, his defense, which ultimately resulted in a court awarding coverage, was that he didn't know there was alcohol in his blood, notwithstanding the fact that the provisions of the policy are pretty clear. It's, it's an all or none, um, and there's no issue of, of diligence. It's reared its head again in this action. So the facts are pretty simple. Um, Ms. Kozel was 77 years old at the time she had an accident in Florida. Before the accident, uh, several months before, she had gotten a, an envelope in the mail from the Ministry of Transportation, and uh, she didn't open it, and it was her license renewal. And she believed it was something about her sticker renewal, and she had given that to a car dealership when she was purchasing a car for them to do the licensing several months before, and she had assumed that's what it was. Uh, she wasn't aware that it actually had documentation relating to the renewal of her actual driver's license. Several months later, in February 2012, she's in an accident in Florida, severely injured a motorcyclist, and she came back uh, from Florida and renewed her license at that point in time, and then was subsequently sued. So obviously, the insurer brought a motion on the grounds that she was in breach of her insurance policy for not being authorized to drive at the time of the accident. And the two issues that came up on the application were the same two issues addressed by the Court of Appeal. Number one, was she in breach of her insurance policy at the time of the accident? And number two, if she was in breach, is she entitled to relief from forfeiture under Section 98 of the Courts of Justice Act? What was interesting here is the Court of Appeal reversed both decisions of the application judge, but still found Cole to be successful on the motion and granted her coverage. And here's how they did it. Uh, first, they said that she was not diligent. And, and they pointed out the fact that she'd had a driver's license for 60 years. It had been renewed on time. And at this point in time, she hadn't even inquired uh, as to what was in the contents of the envelope or taken any steps to ensure she had a valid license. So they disagreed with the application judge that she actually had been diligent. They, they opined that diligence actually requires some active effort. So there is an absence of reasonable care on her part. Uh, but then we get into the twilight zone, in my opinion. Um, the question was whether or not the breach of statutory condition 4.1 was an imperfect compliance with a policy term 
or whether it was noncompliance with a condition precedent. Now you would imagine that the fact that the title of the statutory conditions includes the word condition makes it pretty clear that it's a condition. But the Court of Appeal disagreed. They said it was a relatively minor offense. Um, so what they said was, uh, in a, actually a paragraph 47 of the decision, they said uh, the respondent's breach was not a fundamental breach. They said it had it been a more substantial breach, for example, if she had been drinking heavily prior to driving, she may have been barred from obtaining relief from forfeiture. I find that incredibly ironic in light of the decision in Tut, but the court didn't, uh, didn't address that. Their ultimate conclusion was it was a relatively minor breach, and so that left them with the dilemma of relief from forfeiture. Under Section 129 of the Insurance Act, it's clear that the uh, relief from forfeiture under that provision is restricted to imperfect compliance after a loss has occurred. In this situation, her non-compliance occurred before the loss. And so really this decision hinges on a court finding that the failure uh, of Ms. Kozel to ensure that she was actually duly authorized to drive amounted to an imperfect compliance, not a violation of a condition precedent under the policy. And as evidence of that, they pointed to the fact that the insurer was unable to point to a specific part of the contract that stressed that being authorized to drive was a condition precedent Again, I completely ignoring the, the title of the statutory conditions. Um, so that leaves, under Section 129, the, the fact that the insurer can't rely on Section 129 for acts committed by the insured before the, uh, uh, the loss left them with the opportunity to find relief from forfeiture under Section 98, and that's exactly what they did. And this is why we think this is a, a pretty serious case for you guys to consider is because, number one, it has considerably broadened the scope of relief for, for forfeiture for an insured, and uh, they actually articulated in there that it's going to be a rare case where an insured's breach is, will be considered to be a, uh, a fundamental breach of a condition precedent. Uh, in fact, what they said is um, the, uh, well, actually, I'll get back to that. The, the court had a pretty strong statement limiting the cases as non-compliant with a condition precedent. And what that means for our insured is, and what it means for you, is when you get cases in and it looks like somebody has breach the statutory condition, that may not be the end of it uh, in, in any event. What we're going to need to do is take a look at what is the likelihood that a court is going to view it as a serious versus minor breach. Um, and in light of the wording of the OAP-1, I just I don't see that there's a lot of opportunity for insurers to take any steps to protect themselves from these sorts of decisions that are going to trigger coverage and inevitably indemnity. Yeah, you won't know, yeah. despite what they say. All right, we're uh, rapidly uh, approaching the top of the hour, so we're going to uh, press right along with uh, case number seven. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rip through this one, and uh, what's after what's the next one? After Meyer? That's it. That's it. Uh, are we doing Boyce? Is Boyce on here? Oh yeah, sorry, Boyce is next. After that. Okay, so I'll so I'll, I'll go through. Uh, I'm going to do my Meyer and Boyce really quickly. Great. So uh, Meyer was uh, it's just a cost um, uh, case. Uh, what is kind of interesting about this case is that the um, so the plaintiff was seeking two million dollars in the middle of the trial. Apparently, she sought uh, relief to amend her claim uh, and move the amount she was claiming up to two million dollars. Probably a mistake because then the jury only awarded her one hundred nineteen thousand uh, dollars. So that's what she gets, and the plaintiffs seek costs of four hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. 156,000 of which were for disbursements. So the court looked at this and said, look, the, plea, the plaintiff's fees are not in proportion to the type of action, or more importantly, that which was awarded. And on the contrary, it looked at the defendant's costs, which were only about 120, and found that those were more reasonable. And so the court looked at the defendant's um, offers, uh, and now the, the problem that they had was they were Rule 49 offers, but they weren't broken down. So it, they weren't able to know exactly how much was paid under each head of damage. But what they did note that uh, one offer of $1.5 million was higher than the award, well, much higher than the award, uh, and, the, um, uh, and the cost being uh, requested. The judge said that the problem with those Rule 49 offers uh, were just technical ones. In fact, they didn't break them down. So what he did was he, he kind of, the, the judge stood back and said, look, um, you know, you've got to be proportional with your costs, um, and uh, but I can still look at those co those offers that are uh, Rule 49 offers, but may, might not be in perfect compliance. 
I can still look at them. And so as a result, what he did was he did not award either side any costs, which means that the plaintiff's uh, claim, if you even look at the 156000 for disbursements, and she's awarded 119000 means that her the plaintiff's claim ended up as a, as a loss. Um, so that's my and I'm going to zip over to, do you want to do O'Connell first? Yeah, okay. a short summary on O'Connell. Uh, again, this goes back to the broadening of uh, the scope of coverage and uh, denying opportunities to deny coverage. So in O'Connell, an at-fault driver not authorized to drive. Uh, what happened was she was driving on a 400 series highway at the time of the accident and she only had a G1 license. The gentleman who owned the car had been dating her for five months and uh, had not taken any active steps to confirm that she had a valid license and was permitted to drive on the highway. Um, you can see that his, his, uh, neck, his steps that he had taken uh, amounted effectively to he had witnessed her trying to get into bars and using the license and, was, and she was able to do that. Uh, the court accepted evidence that the G1 and the regular license looked the same and uh, there wasn't a great deal of difference between them and the relationship of five months was a relationship of trust. Um, there is an implicit finding by the court there that that somehow uh, gave rise to due diligence and steps having been taken. So, uh, I mean, the net result of this, uh, I think this really good, comes back, uh, it, there's two branches. Number one is underwriting. Uh, there, there needs to be some sort of active measures taken to, con to uh, con confirm that if there's an additional insured or a member of the household on the policy that the named insured has actually taken steps to verify they've got a license. The second thing, again, in conjunction with COZEL, is it's going to be very difficult to deny coverage on an issue of a breach of a statutory condition. You know, what I love about that case is if you had asked the boyfriend or the girlfriend what they thought of a relationship after five months, I bet there'd be two distinct, distinctly different okay. answers. <laughs> Okay, and we have uh, one last case to wrap it up. Apologies, we've just gone over 1 o'clock. If you do have to run and have some questions, please do send them in, and uh, Mitch or Sean will be happy to get back to you after the webinar to uh, answer those questions. And right now, we'll just jump to uh, the final case uh, over Mitch. The only thing I'm going to say about voice is that um, some policies, uh, commercial liability policies, will state that there's a one-year limitation. Some will state that there's a two-year limitation. The ones that state that there is a one-year limitation based on the statutory conditions is valid. So you can have a one-year limitation period on a claim made against the insurer on a commercial policy. That's it. And that's it. Yep. I, I added the Casper case to that one just for anyone who's interested because it's it was applying voice. Uh, they ultimately weren't successful. The context is important. What the court in voice held was that a business agreement as defined under the applicable act could include an insurance policy if it was between a corporation and an insurer, in other words, not an individual on behalf of the household. And what was interesting in Casberg is it wasn't a commercial general policy. It was an accident, or sorry, not an accident, a long-term benefits uh, policy that was in place between a police force and, uh, and an insurer. And the court just kind of skipped over it uh, and, and it seemed to agree that, yeah, that would be a business agreement under the policy. So this is a sort of decision we could see applied to long-term disability insurers, potentially to fleet automotive insurers where insurance policies are between the individual uh, company and, uh, and the insurer. Even though the affected insureds are individuals, it could have some legs in being applied to those cases. Okay. Again, thank you, everyone. If you do have to run, uh, perhaps you going to catch the second half of uh, England against Portugal. Thank you for uh, missing the first half and, uh, and watching this uh, webinar with us. Our next webinar will actually be uh, presented as with uh, Risk Management Council, one of the, the National Association of Insurance Firms that our Kelly Santini is a part of, and uh, Kelly Santini's Samantha Iturgi, if I pronounced that right, uh, she'll be uh, presenting that. That's taking place on June 26th, along with uh, colleagues from uh, Saskatchewan and British Columbia discussing coverage and if you're interested in further details on that please do drop me a re re reply to the email confirmation email that you received for this uh, webinar I'll happily send you along the, the details for that webinar and do we have any uh, questions that have come in yes uh, there's one quick question uh, either one said uh, with respect to the discussion on latches what the doctrine was the doctrine of latches is an equitable doctrine it's a defense that's usually invoked by a party that says uh, you've waited too long, even though there might not be uh, necessarily an applicable limitation period. The fact is either you've waited too long to assert your rights or you've acquiesced to not bringing litigation uh, and something has happened that has prejudiced us in the meantime, so we're not going to allow you to, uh, to bring this case at this time. It, it goes back, again, historically in, in the courts of equity, which are hundreds of years old and, and fascinating only to law nerds. 
and academics. Uh, the key point here being that what the court has said is, uh, again, this, this really hits on the key point of the intact Lombard case. There is no provision in the, in the Insurance Act of Regulations as to the time limitation period under which a loss transfer provision must be sent to the other side. In other words, if the accident happens in 2010, there's nothing saying that a request for transfer has to be sent within a certain period of time. What the courts have upheld is that once that request is sent, the insurer only has two years to commence an action. Um, and that was the crux of both of these cases, is that in the intervening time period, in one case four years and in another case 11 years, no request had been sent. And the question was, what was a reasonable amount of time. So again, what the courts looked at in both cases was the equitable doctrine. There's a, a, a fancy Latin phrase that goes along with it that effectively says that uh, the courts and law favors people who act on their rights, not the people who sleep on them. Uh, so that's where the doctrine comes from, and, and that's the context in which it was applied in the course. Okay, thank you, Sean. And uh, just to note, uh, somebody's come in who's uh, unfortunately just left, left saying, please keep me on your list, uh, and by all means, uh, we will uh, be sending out, uh, I'm sure many of you are receiving the Canadian anti-spam legislation uh, emails and, and requests for consent. Uh, Kelly Santini will be sending one out in the coming days. And uh, by all means, if you do want to continue to receive the invitations for the webinars, uh, please take note of that email when it does come in. Uh, one last question, and then we'll let uh, everyone uh, return to lunch or their desk or whatever it might be. Um, why was due diligence even considered in Cazelle? Isn't it a breach of contract? Well, that's a great question. Uh, the same issue came up in Tut, and frankly, I'm a little confused as to how it came up. I, I can opine as to how it did, and, and I'm not sure why defense counsel in either case appears to have acquiesced to it. Effectively, what happened in Tut was the court considered that the, the act of driving or the offense of driving uh, with alcohol in the blood, it wasn't just a breach of the insurer's policy. It was actually a Highway Traffic Act offense. And what plaintiff's counsel quite cleverly argued is that that's a strict liability offense and that in criminal law, any strict liability offense or provincial offense in quasi-criminal is entitled to the defense of due diligence if you took active steps um, to, uh, to try to, to comply with the law. But what's confusing is that in this case, we're not dealing with an offense. The denial of coverage is not based on the offense or on charges. It's based on, again, a breach of contract. Uh, but for some reason, the court seems to have opined that if you're entitled to that defense in a quasi-criminal proceeding, shouldn't you be entitled to the same defense with respect to coverage? And so the same issue came up in Cozell, and the application court said, yes, she was uh, due diligent and, uh, and demonstrated that. Fortunately, the court of appeal overturned that, but didn't go as far as questioning why uh, it was considered in the first place. All right. Thank you, Sean, and thank you, everyone, once again, for joining us. Uh, one last question. If uh, copies of the presentation will be available, and yes, we'll be happy to uh, email those out to everyone in the next uh, 24 hours, and uh, a recording of this webinar will be up on Kelly Santini's YouTube channel uh, within 24 hours as well. All the uh, past uh, insurance law webinars can be found there as well. Well, thank you all uh, once again. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Mitch. And thank you. Uh, wishing you all a great day.